We're going to get started. Um, so welcome, everyone. My name is Chiquita Paula D'Souza. I'm one of the education chairs on the American Academy of Pediatrics section on Global Health Executive Committee. I'm pleased to introduce the next webinar in the AAP Global COVID series, Global Health Practice in the Time of COVID, Finding Effectiveness in Your Personal and Professional World. Our fourth webinar, Acting on Health Disparities Locally and Globally, Where to Start, will begin shortly. This is hosted by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Council on Immigrant, Child, and Family Health, the Section on Global Health, and Emory Global Health Institute. We have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, the webinar will begin shortly with panelist presentations followed by a Q&A. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation and just make sure to select all panelists before you hit submit. Um, that way we won't miss any questions. Um, and also feel free to um, answer the question that has already been submitted about future webinar topics that you'd like us to cover. Before proceeding, I'd like to uh, just have you guys save the date for the next webinar. As you can see, it's going to be on personal protective equipment, what to wear and what to share on July 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. I will now hand over to Dr. Sajda, the Associate Director of Emory Global Health Institute. Um, an immediate past chair of the section on global health, who will introduce our panelists and be our moderator for this section. Thank you, Dr. Sachta. Great. Uh, <clears throat> welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And we're here to talk about the intersection of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, health disparities and inequities, the, the two most important issues of this year, this decade, and possibly our lifetime. And we're fortunate uh, to have with us today four pediatricians and and uh, renowned experts on this very issue. Um, so before we jump into their sessions, I'd like to introduce our, our four um, panelists. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Dr. Anissa Ibrahim, who's Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Medical Director of the Harborview Pediatrics Clinic, uh, where I did my uh, clinical training as well. Um, she's an expert on caring for and outreach to immigrant and refugee populations. And after Dr. Ibrahim, we'll hear from Dr. Christy Clark, who's a pediatrician and medical epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, focusing on child health, including nutrition, adolescent and reproductive health, global immunization, and birth defects. And she's led numerous emergency responses, including deployments to combat Ebola, and most recently as the lead of the Disproportionately Affected Populations Team for the CDC COVID-19 response. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Kajal Khanna, who's Assistant uh, Professor in Pediatric Emergency Medicine at Stanford and the Director and Founder of the Global Pediatric Emergency Equity Lab. Her research and scholarly interests are in pediatric emergency care in low-middle-income countries and a rights-based approach to health systems development. And last but not least, we'll hear from Dr. Vidya Ramanathan, who's a pediatrician at St. Joe's Hospital Emergency Department in Ann Arbor the medical director of the University of Michigan Asylum Collaborative, and a medical expert for Physicians for Human Rights. She is a strong advocate for human rights and mentors medical students and residents in doing asylum exams. So with that, I'll turn the um, platform over to um, uh, Anissa to, to start us off. Wonderful. <clears throat> Uh, thank you so much. I'm so um, happy to be here um, with everyone and all the experts on this panel. Um, today, I'd like to share a little bit about lessons learned about public health messaging um, during the COVID pandemic and how this has led to disparities um, in limited English proficiency communities in Seattle, <clears throat> and specifically Harborview and the UW medical system in which I practice. Um, our learning objectives including reviewing data for the limited English proficiency patients in Washington State, identifying barriers to COVID-19 public health messaging recommendations and how this has led to disparities in outcomes, and describing strategies that effectively communicate with immigrant and limited English proficiency communities. Now, Washington State was one of the states that was hit hard and hit early with uh, COVID. I think many remember the Kirkland Life Center where there was a huge outbreak and um, then that uh, passed on into the community. As of yesterday, these numbers are not accurate for today. We had four, over 40,000 confirmed cases with um, a little over 1,400 deaths in the community. Um, more, a lot of these were in Western Washington, as you see in the darker blue, but uh, many of these cases and um, deaths are in Eastern Washington where there's a um, bigger immigrant um, community specifically, um, uh, a Spanish-speaking community. 
Um, now, while COVID-19 was being dubbed a great equalizer, or um, many uh, the media was saying that COVID-19 doesn't discriminate, um, we knew that much like other diseases and pandemics, that COVID-19 would fall um, among uh, uh, fall essentially between the fight, fault lines of racism and social determinants of health and race. Um, and at Washington State had race data at the time that we were having these conversations for only 67% of uh, COVID deaths, which uh, our ability to draw big conclusions. But uh, that being said, we were able to see trends. Um, so these were the initial numbers that we um, saw from the Washington State Department of Health, and these have been updated. But taking a deeper look at other data, um, when you break down these numbers, which may not, which you may not be able to see significant discrepancies in right now, but you break them down further and you look at age-adjusted rates per 100,000 um, people in Washington State, you quickly begin to see that hospitalizations are seven times higher um, for uh, Hispanic people and three times higher for Black people and American Indian people as compared to white people. Um, the other thing that you saw was among COVID-19 deaths, the rates were actually three times higher for Hispanic and um, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander when compared to white people. Now, early on, the health systems and states didn't have any language data at all. We have huge immigrant populations, um, and we're a big state for resettlement. We're second in the nation for um, resettlement, but they just did not have any language numbers. So there was a huge push to say that there's power in data um, as it reveals the health inequities that lead to health disparities, and we needed those numbers in order to address them. And not looking at the numbers does not make it go away. It actually worsens the issue. So we partnered with the Department of Health, um, UW Medicine, which is, a, uh, which is a huge entity here, and public health to say we really do need these numbers. Um, now, I'll get to this chart, but um, what we saw is when there was a huge review by the Department of Health, there were only about 50% of cases had, um, had language data, and the other 50% were missing language data. Um, but of the cases with known language data, we saw that um, there was already discrepancies and um, seeing people who had limited language proficiency or um, did not prefer to, who preferred to speak a language other than English in, um, or communicating in language other than uh, English were being hospitalized more and were having worse outcomes. Now, for example, um, of the, although the population, um, the percent of Washington population that had, has limited English proficient and speaks Spanish is 6.44%, um, these individuals accounted for 26% of cases. Um, now, when you look at um, another group in Washington State, the Marshallese population, they account for 0.1% of the population that has limited English proficiency. Um, and again, they accounted for 1.2% of the cases, which shows significant um, uh, discrepancies, which we would not have seen in race or any other data. Now, in this chart, we're looking at hospitalization um, data. So the percent of confirmed cases with each primary language um, who were hospitalized. And essentially, you start to see the discrepancies here where our Ukrainian families and our Tagalog families and our Russian um, families were being hospitalized at higher rates. So this higher rate of um, limited English proficiency um, families among those hospitalized essentially suggests that there's increased exposure, um, of course, either due to um, the work being essential workers um, being, or other um, the social determinants of health, but also that there's systemic barriers that are leading to um, not accessing health care um, in a, um, in a, or not having access to health care in similar ways, therefore leading to more severe disease and hospitalization. Now, these disparities actually made us question what is happening upstream? What inequities are we contributing to upstream from um, patients actually coming to the hospital and being so ill that they need to be hospitalized? And there were three things that we um, saw that uh, were essentially leading to ineffective public health messaging. And the three things to consider are the message, the messenger, and the modality. Um, now, the message is primarily what are we telling limited English proficiency communities and how is that message getting to them? Um, First, one of the biggest things that we saw was there were huge pushes on social media with flyers um, and brochures and people saying, um, hello, this is the next big thing for um, COVID-19. Um, and then there was a lag time, two to three days before this information was translated into many different languages. So that's three days that limited English proficiency communities lost. Those were lies that were on the risk during this time. Um, there wasn't a huge partnership with um, uh, different communities, and many of these recommendations were rooted in privilege. When we tell people you should isolate at home, you should not interact with grandparents, well, what happens in a multi-generational household that has two rooms to share? None of those recommendations make any sense, and we did not actually have an equity lens on the recommendations that we were making in general. 
Um, so both of those needed to um, be addressed and I'll talk about um, partnerships soon. A second is the messenger. Many, uh, as uh, we have seen, and I, even I'm from the Somali community and we have trusted public health messengers within our community. We are not looking to the faceless hospital system to give us our medical information that for us to trust and uh, take forward. And many uh, people in the community will say, well, who did you hear that from? And more often than not, we overlook the critical messengers within the community to deliver our public health messages. Um, so the most, the two things that I think we should always ask if we're, if we're giving a messenger into a community or trying to get information into a community is one, are they trusted? And two, are they from the community? And if we um, don't have those two things, then we really need to look at um, what we're doing um, and can our message actually be um, effective? Um, the third one is the modality. Now, I think COVID-19 has pushed everything online. Everyone is staying at home. There's Zoom, there's WebEx, there's all these things. And this just further divided um, the digital divide. Um, and it, there's a huge technology gap between communities. So, um, and then the other thing is literacy. Someone can speak five languages and be literate in none of them. So brochures and, you know, having a Twitter feed and having a Facebook post does nothing for those communities. Um, same way that, you know, um, watching King 5 News won't do anything for them because they don't, that's not the language in which they communicate in. Um, so, again, using those messengers to dive into the community did a helpful, um, uh, was critical for our outreach because what they showed us is you can actually go in and figure out what the communities are using, including WhatsApp. We found out that Facebook Live was a huge thing and voice notes were um, huge things that actually contributed to um, uh, messages more being more effectively pushed into communities and those were not the, the avenues or the modalities that we would have thought to use. And last, I'll end with um, this, and I think it's something that I truly um, try to live by. Improving public health messaging and communication is rooted in partnerships. And these are partnerships that you have to start and maintain and mobilize before, during, and after um, any kind of pandemic or any public health initiative. And that's partnership with local organizations. Um, they will help adapt messages so that they're cult culturally congruent. They will help evaluate and um, uh, provide alternatives. They can really um, inform, uh, you know, translations and ensuring that they get out there um, fast. That being said, those we do need to value our organization's time and put our funding um, and our money where our mouth is and not really push, you know, free labor on them because they care for their community. And then the last thing is really community media. And I think it's huge power in community media. There are um, certain um, countries that are like Spanish language um, media or Somali language media or any, you know, ex language media and having partnering with them so they can be pushing the same messages out was critical um, to Seattle, uh, especially in the Seattle area, because we were able to get out a lot more information um, among uh, communities that were really not getting the information that they needed and were um, as essentially suffering and having more cases due to um, the way that we were transmitting messages. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Um, that was a great uh, uh, introduction and uh, uh, into this um, important topic and, and your experiences in, in, in Washington State are very helpful um, for us to, to take in mind. And so I'd like to turn it over now to um, Dr. Christy Clark, um, who will um, talk to us about uh, some of the efforts at, uh, at CDC. Thank you so much. It's so good to be with you today. So I'm going to be focusing on disparities and challenges uh, faced by three different populations. And my data are going to be specifically focused on the United States context for international viewers. Um, so we'll be talking about racial and ethnic minority groups and where limited pediatric data are available. We are going to be discussing some all age data, uh, people with disabilities with a focus on children and youth and people experiencing homelessness, again, with a focus on youth. And we wanna also talk about what we can do. So I'll be providing some practical and actionable um, resources to better understand and address these issues as well. So first regarding um, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, the COVID pandemic is the most significant public health challenge that our nation has faced in more than a century. And it's forced um, all of us to really take a look at the impact of centuries of inequities that have systematically undermined the physical, social, material, and emotional health of racial and ethnic minority populations. Current data suggests a disproportionate burden of illness 
among certain racial and ethnic minority groups. And that is that they make up a greater proportion of the cases than you would expect given the demographic makeup of our country. Now, the data I'm going to be presenting on these following slides are based on data reported from state and local health departments to the CDC. And I should note, um, as noted on this slide, um, that the data are not complete. Um, so we do not yet have a complete picture on disparities by race and ethnicity, but it is important to examine the data that we do have. Um, so speaking about the disproportionate burden of cases, this is case data, all ages. 20% of cases um, you can see in this data set were in people of non-Hispanic black race, but that compares to that population being 13% of the U.S. population. 33% were in people of Hispanic or Latino ethnicity of any race, and that compares to uh, a makeup of 19% of the U.S. population. So now particularly looking at pediatric data and trust to our audience, um, especially today. Um, and you can see here that the distribution is different with over um, half of pediatric cases within this data set occurring among Hispanic or Latino uh, children, uh, whereas that's only 25% of the US pediatric uh, population. Again, uh, unfortunately the data are uh, as yet incomplete. So here we're doing a side by side. So these are subsets of the all age data split into the adult cases 18 and up on the left and pediatric cases zero to 17 on the right. So notable differences include the much higher proportion of cases in Hispanic and Latino children and lower proportion in non-Hispanic white children. In addition, one thing that you could note, although it's a smaller number, it's a big difference. At 2.5% of pediatric cases being among uh, uh, children um, that are uh, of American Indian Alaska Native population as compared to 1.3% among adults. But cases are only part of the story. So we can look here at hospitalizations. And this is here, it looks at things per 100,000 population. So it, it then um, it takes away some of that, um, it makes the disparities more evident because um, we're looking at things within the context of the demographics. So you can see here that um, non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native persons have an age-adjusted hospitalization rate 5.7 times that of non-Hispanic white persons. For uh, non-Hispanic black persons, that's 5.7 times higher. And for those of Hispanic or Latino ethnicity, again, this is all age data, 4.5 times higher. Now there are existing data that are quite limited. Um, but thus far, um, when looking at the preliminary data on children pertaining to most racial and ethnic minority groups are demonstrating higher hospitalization rates um, uh, among the minority groups as compared to non-Hispanic whites, uh, but more details will be available as the pediatric sample size within this data set increases. I will note that on this slide, I am presenting data from the American Public Media Research Lab. And here we're looking at deaths. So we're looking at COVID-19 deaths per 100,000 uh, by racial ethnic group, and this is again, all age data. Um, and the most striking thing here is that non-Hispanic black Americans experienced the highest overall mortality rate. And um, as seen here, twice that of all other groups with the exception of American Indian and Alaska and native populations. Now, fortunately, the pediatric death toll due to COVID-19 um, has been comparably low. Um, there are far less data, so I don't have a comparable analysis um, in children. Now we do have further work to do, and that includes addressing incomplete data by backfilling via review of medical charts or other records, as well as doing more in-depth analyses, looking at the interaction or um, the, uh, the different relationships between variables like race and ethnicity and other variables uh, like age, a disability, or other factors. So again, um, here are just a few resources. What can we do as pediatricians? Um, so some things that can be done are just to stay informed on what the current data are on racial and ethnic disparities, and a list of all these resources will be available and sent out after the talk, um, and as well as accessing and increasing the awareness in our work settings of resources to both identify implicit biases as well as um, how those biases can affect decision making. Um, ensuring adequate medical interpreters and accessing resources such as the one on this slide to reduce cultural barriers to care. 
Another population that is experiencing disparities due to COVID-19 is people with disabilities. And that's 26% of the U.S. adult population. And this population is also three times more likely to have um, certain underlying conditions that are associated with an increased risk of severe illness secondary to COVID-19 where they become infected. One in every five U.S. children approximately have special health care needs. And based on preliminary data, um, children and youth with special health needs may be at higher risk of contracting COVID-19 or at um, increased risk of severe illness. There are some emerging data, such as um, a recent study regarding developmental disability. And also, when you take a look at CDC case surveillance data, out of 449 uh, children under 18 with a disability who had COVID-19, 22% were hospitalized. And that compares to 1.6% um, of those in the data set identified as not having a disability. I should note that, again, um, the disability variable is, is incomplete in this data set. There was a survey of about 8,000 uh, families of children with autism, and they found that these families are really seeing a lot of effects due to the pandemic, um, from disrupted services to mental health impacts and some of the problems that can go along with all of that. And some of the techniques that they found to try to address this that could also um, be helpful to other children and youth with special health needs are social stories, increasing their social connectedness, using the ability for telehealth, but more research really needs to be done on the, how the needs of all children and youth with special health needs can be best addressed in the context of COVID-19. As we counsel our patients with special health care needs, keep in mind that local education agencies in the United States must continue to provide free and appropriate education for children and youth with special health needs to the extent possible if general education opportunities are being provided. And in terms of our CDC resources, we are working hard to look at guidance and considerations documents and make them as inclusive and comprehensive as possible for people with disabilities as well. Here are just a few of the resources that are going to be in the set of links available, including um, for direct service providers and those with developmental and behavioral disorders in their families. And finally, um, to discuss another group at, um, disproportionate, at risk of disproportionate impact are um, people experiencing homelessness. There's a lot on this slide, so let's focus on a few key messages. Um, so of the over half a million people experiencing homelessness on a given night in the United States, over 100,000 are under age 18, and 10,000 of those are within an unsheltered setting. Um, people experiencing homelessness are also um, have increased uh, prevalence of underlying medical conditions that can impact risk of developing severe illness, such as diabetes and hypertension. Of course, shelters and other settings uh, where um, people experiencing homelessness could receive uh, uh, services uh, tend to be in congregate settings, and those are settings which we know can facilitate the spread of infection. In a recent study, universal testing was performed after clusters of cases were identified in five shelters across three cities. In those shelters with um, cases, clusters of cases identified, between 17 and 66% of residents um, tested positive. A more recent uh, MMWR looked at um, data from one urban safety net hospital, and of non-ICU hospitalizations, 24% in that population were experiencing homelessness. Um, so we really need to assess the impact of non-medical uh, respite settings, and which is something that was implemented in, in that setting, as well as other strategies to address health-related social needs of patients with uh, COVID-19 who may not be able to isolate in their home uh, social environment. Uh, highlighted here is a printable fact sheet designed for homeless youth and other resources for people experiencing homelessness and their service providers. Homeless youth experience lack of access and isolation um, prior to COVID. So this could be worsened in the current context and continuity of outreach and services for homeless youth are critical. We've been um, in frequent touch with partners and stakeholders and provided uh, technical assistance to multiple state and territorial health departments uh, working with uh, outbreaks within populations. 
I'd like to thank um, those from my team, as well as the Minority Health Rural Health Team and the Office of the Chief Health Equity Officer for the COVID response for their assistance with resources and data for these slides. And back over to you, Carmi. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Chrissy. That was uh, fabulous. Um, so next, we're going to go to uh, Dr. Uh, Kanna, um, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. I can... Great. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the AP for inviting me to be a part of this panel, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to think about how we might act locally to impact global health disparities. My talk this morning or afternoon will uh, feature two learning objectives, looking at global health disparities during COVID-19 and the indirect effects on child mortality, and the potential of a health justice and human rights approach in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. The next couple of figures just talk about the global spread of COVID-19. This figure is from July 6th, but as of July 12th, there were over 12.2 million cases of COVID-19 around the world with over 560,000 deaths. <clears throat> this slide begins to look at the testing per GDP per capita, and the following slide looks at how ca rapidly cases are rising. Again, all of these figures are taken from our world and data, which has really done an excellent job of looking at how uh, COVID is unfolding in different countries, and you can model their experiences from the start of the pandemic to now. So this slide highlights some of the headlines concerning the threats to the determinants of health that are happening globally. The World Bank is concerned that COVID-19 could push 100 million people into extreme poverty. We are now on track for the first time to regress in human development. There's concerns about widespread famine, um, from the World Food Program. The Imperial College in England has developed some really nice modeling when we look at the impact of in inequity on the spread and severity of COVID-19. So they were able to look at critical care bed capacity and what found that in low and middle income countries, critical care bed capacity would be outstripped by demand by a factor of 25 as opposed to a factor of seven in high income countries, which is something we would see here. They then looked at the impact of being able to wash your hands, being able to work from home and socially distance, and your physical distance from a healthcare facility, and found that in the poorest countries, or sorry, in the poorest quintiles of low and middle income countries, you would have a 32% increased probability of dying from COVID-19 compared to the wealthiest quintile in those same countries. So we've talked a lot about the direct impact of COVID-19 on child mortality, but really we're talking about an acute on chronic health emergency. And as services and interventions shift from standard reproductive, neonatal and child health services, we're gonna have increased child deaths. <clears throat> and the Robertson et al. paper that came out earlier this year in uh, Lancet Global Health modeled what would happen if we had changes in interventions so for things like antibiotics for pneumonia or sepsis or oral rehydration salts for diarrhea. And currently we're at about 430,000 deaths of children under five per month. And with a 25% reduction in those particular interventions and wasting, we're looking at a 44.7% increase in child deaths in low and middle income countries per month. So shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about the right to health and what does that bring to our response for COVID-19. So the right to health was first articulated in the World Health Organization's constitution back in 1946, and again in the International Covenant for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in 1966. And the right to health is considered an inclusive right, meaning that it's not only that you have the right to health services, but you also have the right to the determinants of health underlying the right to health. So access to safe water, access to nutrition, access to housing, and access to information about healthcare and health services. And in May of 2000, the committee that monitors the right to health and really explains to countries that have signed on to this covenant, which includes almost every country in the world, except for the United States, what their obligations are under the right to health, they developed this AAAQ uh, format. And what that means is that services and health services must be available they must be accessible, not only physically, but also economically. Information about health services needs to be accessible. They need to be acceptable, meaning they need to be culturally appropriate and of good medical ethics, and they need to be of high quality. So when we're thinking about the COVID-19 response, really we need to ensure that prevention, treatment, access to information is equitably driven to all populations within a country, 
And these binding obligations under the right to health really force governments not only to think about their physical distancing and their other measures, but how their um, strategies are the broader social response of their strategies. And that will ensure that the measures that they implement are transparent, they encourage participation, they're efficient and effective. So a lot has been done in the last couple of years on high quality healthcare systems. And remember that high quality and good quality is a core tenant under the right to health. So in 2018, there was a Lancet Global Health Commission on high quality health systems, and they came up with this framework to say, how can we improve quality? Because in the last 20 years, we've had this global era of, um, golden era of global health, in that we've expanded services, we've expanded access to the determinants of health. But without thinking about quality, we will not see the healthcare outcomes we seek to achieve. And so I challenge you now to think about, okay, what could we do locally to impact some of these inputs that make a system responsive, accountable, and um, having the trust of the citizens that it serves. So we can look at foundations and learning. As residencies move to online platforms, can we develop truly glo global collaborative ways of learning? Can we modernize service delivery? As we move to telehealth to access some of the healthcare deserts in this country, could we assist with building that capacity globally? So, you know, what does the value add of the right to health? What kind of tool does it bring to change? And for me, it's a tool that looks at how we design, implement, analyze healthcare policies. It's a means of bringing accountability into the system to galvanize advocacy and to um, bring empowerment to marginalized or vulnerable populations. It's a way to analyze how um, threats are happening to your determinants of health and how to respond. So really, how can we bring a health equity lens to the COVID-19 response and recovery? So I'll end with a short story that's not my own, and I won't bring it justice, but you can read about it online. It's that of Dr. Jane Philpott, who is Canada's former healthcare minister. And in the early 1990s, she was working in Niger as a family medicine physician, and unfortunately, her both daughters contracted meningitis, and her two-and-a-half-year-old daughter passed away. And she describes at the funeral of her daughter that local mourners came to her with a saying that was, there is only patience in the face of grief, in the face of sadness, in the face of inequity. And I would argue that at this time, we are at a turning point in our world, and there is no longer time for patience, and we shouldn't be patient. And I would say that now we're in a very amazing case to truly ignite locally global demand for change. So back to you. Thanks so much. Um, this is some great uh, thoughts to, to ponder, and hopefully we can continue that discussion in, in the Q&A. So, so last but not least, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Vermonathan to, um, to take the floor. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. Um, go on, yeah. Gosh, thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this great panel. What a great joy it is to be here with you all today. Um, so, I have no disclosures. So today I'm going to be giving an overview on the vast health disparities that already exist for globally displaced people, and then I'll get into how COVID-19 just adds immense complexity to this already dire situation. Let's first define our term. According to the UN, Displaced peoples are those who are forced to leave home either because of war or persecution based on political opinion, race, religion, nationality, or membership in a particular social group. People may have other reasons such as domestic violence or trafficking, but this doesn't always warrant asylum or refugee status. People may be internally displaced within their own country, which is most common, or they may have to cross borders. These are some of the more permanent refugee settlements that I visited, but temporary ones may use tents instead. So why talk about displaced peoples here today? Well, there are almost 80 million displaced people worldwide, and as you can see in the lower middle area, 40% of them are children. So this is really a pediatric issue. In order to introduce the topic of health disparities in this population, I think it's best illustrated through a story. This is about Chul, a nine-year-old boy from South Sudan. I heard this story from Lindsay Adario, a photojournalist. One night in May 2015, a group of armed men ransacked a village in South Sudan, raping and killing many residents. 
Chul and his eight siblings hid in the brush as his father was burned alive in the massacre. That night, his mother sent him and his sister to walk to a refugee camp in Kenya, figuring that it was their only chance of survival. They spent months walking and swimming through crocodile-infested waters. Along the way, they met Lindsay, and they made a real impression on her. Eventually, they reached the Kenyan camp. Months later, Lindsay went back to South Sudan and tracked down Chul's mother out of thousands of people in the area. Sitting her down gently, Lindsay asked his mother if there was anything that she would want to say to him. Lindsay was going to see him next. She expected this distraught mother to ask him to come home. But instead, Chul's mother sat up straight and with tears streaming down her face, she looked straight into the camera and she said, my son, my son, you study. Study with all your heart. Although we are suffering, when you come back learned, we will be better. We have nothing to eat, but when you study, all our problems will be solved. I'm a mother, and I often think, what choice did she have? I have spent so much time with many families with similar stories at the Mexican border. Matamoros is the easternmost crossing point from Mexico into the U.S. And while the border is currently closed, about 3,000 people are still waiting there for their asylum cases. They are fleeing extreme violence and crippling poverty that make life impossible at home. These are some of the border tent encampments. These flimsy pieces of cloth are meant to protect families from the elements. But that is not to say that they are somehow pitiable or tragic. It takes some serious gumption, courage, and determination to be able to walk 1,500 miles with your children and then swim across a river, sometimes being separated and kept in cages. Children have told me stories of being fed raw meat and rotten milk while detained en route, but their mothers found them ways to keep them alive because safety is a motivating goal. So when we talk about health disparities in this population, goodness gracious, what disparity is there not for this group? They are vast and far reaching. In the health sector, we can talk about access to medications and hospitals, poor immunization rates. This bottom photo is from when we had to climb up a mountain on foot in the Himalayas to give shots to babies. I was talking about this with Dr. Offit at the last NCE. These people actually want to get their babies vaccinated. But really, all of these factors affect health. Violence, food insecurity, access to education. This top photo is of a one-room schoolhouse in a refugee camp at the Thai-Burma border. A child there said to me, oh, you're so lucky you're from America. All the kids there must be so grateful to get to go to school every day. <laughs> I almost cried. Of course, structural racism. Gosh, I could speak about each one of these for hours some other time. Of course, the pandemic will disproportionately affect displaced people. With crowded camps and limited access to care, the conditions are ripe for mayhem. There are a few examples that I want to discuss. In Burkina Faso and Mali, years of armed conflict have destabilized the region. Now the lockdowns because of COVID are having a huge impact on food insecurity, causing a real humanitarian crisis. Moving to the South Pacific, that region has recently been struck by cyclones. Measures to prevent the spread of COVID began just weeks before the last cyclone hit in April. The compound effects of the natural disaster and the disease on top of that are too much for small islands to grapple with. What is most troubling is the violence that continues worldwide. The UN Secretary General called for a global ceasefire on March 23rd to protect people and the public health infrastructures, but few have heeded his call. Armed groups from Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab in Africa, to Hayat Tahrir Asham in Syria, to MS-13 and Barrio 18 in El Salvador continue to engage in violence. The result is that people are left defenseless in the face of the pandemic. Our great fear locally is for the detainees in the ICE detention facilities, as people are unnecessarily kept in close quarters. 
But even as these facilities may be emptied of children on July 17th per a recent ruling, the fact that the borders are closed and our asylum system has essentially come to a halt is extremely troubling. Groups like Global Resource Management are building some COVID pop-up hospitals for these populations, but it's hard in terms of resources and policies to keep up with the care required. We all must continue to take action and speak out at every opportunity. People ask me why I do this heart-wrenching work. I hark back to when I visited the detention center in Dilly, Texas. I once suddenly found myself surrounded by children there, and I quickly took out some crayons that I happened to have, you know, a pediatrician. <laughs> One little girl drew this for me. She had walked 1,500 miles from Honduras, been separated from her mother for days in a cage and was now in detention, and her mother feared deportation back to the violence that they had fled. What have you drawn for me, I asked her. That's me in my beautiful dress at my house in America when I grow up. I know we'll be fine, she said. We do this work because hope lives in the hearts of children. Let's create the social structures and policies to actually live up to their dreams. Thank you so much to the AAP section on global health Dr. Kameth Rain, to all of you listeners, and to all the brave asylum seekers around the world. Thanks. Thank you so much for that uh, really uh, gut-checking gut uh, um, uh, anecdotes and based on your own work and, uh, again, giving us a lot to think about. Um, so, so I'd like to thank our um, our four amazing panelists. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, to, to, to thank um, the, the AAP for putting this together. Um, and. And so now we're going to turn over to um, um, some discussion and question and answers. And so I encourage the panelists to uh, to put in some of your questions in, in the Q and A uh, box. And as those come in, um, um, we'll then um, um, ask them to to the different uh, speakers. But but to get things uh, started, I, I thought I'd uh, a common theme that um, I heard um, from from many of you is, is the issue of uh, of data. And so I, I like to maybe direct this to Christy Clark to start off with, and then others can kind of chime in. But you know, Lord Lord Kelvin, who um, uh, who kind of uh, you know came up with the the theory of uh, absolute temperature, said if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And so, um, you know, you, you touched on the need of uh, for 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 data and 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 the and the, and the idea that we have, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, only 50 percent of uh, of data on on race and ethnicity in children. So so what um what can, what can we do to get um, uh, better data, especially in in the pediatric population? Yeah, that's a great question for me. And um, so, so first, let's talk about why are these data important. And I and I feel like those those who who dialed into this webinar, you know, are are you know very aware of of these issues. But um, our data on race, ethnicity, age, and sex are really important because they enable us to ensure that all groups have equitable access to testing, um, allow us to accurately determine the burden of infection in specific groups, especially groups, as we were discussing today, that might be disproportionately affected. And um, so we know, as I was discussing in the case surveillance data, those are data that are delivered to us from state and local health departments. Um, and we are working in some cases to to look back at other records to be able to fill in the missing blanks, but we're also trying to um, work with states to provide more information um, in the initial uh, data on race and ethnicity for reported cases. And um, the percent, uh, as a result of this effort, the percent of reported cases that do include race and ethnicity data is increasing over time, and that's something that we're tracking because we're we're, we're keenly aware of the importance there. Um, Another um, uh, item is that the, the Department of Health and Human Services released guidance earlier this week um, that does make it a requirement to include demographic data, um, such as race, ethnicity, age, and sex in reported cases so that we can uh, better understand the burden of COVID-19 um, in, in all populations. Um, and I think, you know, also just sort of, uh, sort of off of this, sometimes the absence of data is also an important data data point because it lets us know what do we need to be doing and who do we need to be in touch with to um, to increase the availability of data. So I do think um, that that uh, reporting on missingness is is also an important thing that we can do to raise awareness of what we have access to, how far we have to go, and maybe places where we're reporting uh, might be better and looking at best practices there to see what can be applied elsewhere as well. 
Thank you. Would uh, any of the panelists like to add anything about uh, data needs and um, in terms of uh, um, you know working in this area of in inequities? Um, okay. I, <clears throat> sorry, I'd like to just add that I think it's really important that we push our local um, powers that be for for local data. Essentially, I think that the more that we continually ring the alarm and say that this data is important and it's really important in um, showing the inequities so that they can be addressed. I think that there is a higher chance that we will be heard. And um, I think there's also an importance in seeing incomplete data. While many people are like uh, afraid to have incomplete data, the reality is we're never gonna have complete data for COVID. It is a pandemic that is ongoing. Um, so if we're seeing inequities in incomplete data, I'm sure there's inequities in complete data. So really looking at data um, longitudinally. Absolutely. So Dr. Kim, I, let, oh, I yeah, just want to say one thing also. I think, you know, the population I work with, uh, you know, is no notoriously underrepresented in terms of data. And so I just wanted to put in a plug, you know, um, even when there is data collected about um, people, for example, in detention facilities, sometimes it's lost or it's thrown out. And I think that we really need to advocate for people collecting data about these populations. I would like to add also in terms of people who might be collecting data, people who might be doing testing or, or completing these forms in the field, some other really important data on, from those forms um, out, outside of, of the, the demographics at the top include um, disability status um, and also a place of residence. Like are they, are, is someone from a congregate setting? Is someone experiencing homelessness? Because all of these are really important questions that we can look at um, when we're trying to address um, what populations could be disproportionate proportionately impacted. And so um, just encouraging uh, folks, I know that there are, there are quite a few questions, but I, I think that these data points are really um, vital in order to be able to, to better understand this pandemic and also what we need to do to better, uh, better serve um, uh, the, the American people. Absolutely. But I'll just piggyback on saying that ringing the bell or ringing the alarm is really, we need to be repeatedly doing that. And stepping up and saying this data is missing or it's not even being collected or it's not even being considered, right? So as I talked about, there are binding obligations and states responsibilities to really think about what, what kind of measures they're putting in place, but they, they haven't even thought about certain populations. I think that's where we can start saying, well, what have you done? And have you even considered just repeatedly sounding that alarm to piggyback on what everyone's already said? Thank you. So another another question that uh, came up, and actually, Kajal, I was thinking about this during your talk too, is um, kind of the the role, uh, you know, thinking a, a broader picture in, in in global health, like like what what's the what what seat does the U.S. have now on this uh, on this table of 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 global health, given that uh, you know the U.S. is failing? I mean, just the, you know the 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 graph you showed of you know uh, you know you know where the the cases are in terms of the COVID, for example, and just you know how we, we're we're failing in our own country, and here we are, a panel of of global health experts. Um, so so how, how do you see that uh, panning out? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a very, very powerful question, right? So I think there are examples, maybe we um, are not the presence on the global stage that we should be at this time, but there are, as we talked about, individual and small group efforts, like when um, Anissa was talking about the message and the messenger and the modality and new avenues and new innovations and in how we tackle this pandemic that I think there are small pockets of innovation that we could really look to transfer on a global stage. And I think that may be where our strength is, or maybe we can look at how we have the chance maybe to look at how we can be truly interdisciplinary in our um, efforts. And maybe that could translate to helping other nations uh, move forward. And so I was really struck by that idea that maybe we could be leaders on, hey, we changed our modality and we changed how we looked at different populations um, and transfer that globally. But it's a very, and I'll put that out to the rest of the group too, um, how to be moving forward in this pandemic where we are not leading on a global stage. Yeah. So, so another another question that came through was was directed more at the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, and and but I think it could be applied to kind of any, any type of messaging that that's coming out in terms of uh, of how 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 to respond to the COVID pandemic, and then how how can that be applied in different settings? So I think the example the 
uh, the person that mentioned was uh, the practice of uh, uh, mother infant separation. Um, if the if the mother is infected with COVID and and to to separate the the child from the mother um, due to, to reduce risk of of, of transmission and. And I and, and Chris, you might be able to comment that too, because I know the CDC has put out some guidance on that too. And then, and so how how do how do these how do these guidances are then interpreted in, um, in in a more global setting, or even even specific settings, even within within the U.S., where um, this, that separation could actually cause more harm than good. So I will say that um, the specific um, guidance regarding a neonatal uh, uh, infection, uh, maternal infection, and, and separation is something that we're um, continually uh, looking at and, um, and also um, looking at the data on any unintended consequences. Um, and I know that you know, AP and CDC both have guidance. I will say that um, this is, um, this is by the clinical group, so it's outside of my particular group. Um, so in terms of, of uh, a great amount of specifics, I don't want to you know, misstate um, some of, of what was behind that guidance at this, at this time, um, but, but certainly something that I could follow up if there's a specific question um, and, and get back to you um, with uh, a response from the group that, that is uh, over that. And I just also want to make a plug. There's going to be another webinar on August 12th uh, by the, the the same series, um, co-sponsored with Save the Children, uh, where they'll be discussing how national pediatric societies have adapted guidelines for local context. So I think that I think that's that's one of the the messages is that you know one one size doesn't fit all, and and then again the the guidance is, you know the way it works in most countries is 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 done at at, at the local level, and so. I think the the context definitely matters in, in interpretation of these things. Um, um, so I guess another, I guess I'll turn to a question to um, uh, to, to Vidya, and uh, the, I guess uh, one of the questions I had when when listening to your talk too was just the, the kind of the the question of intersectionality. Just um, there's there's so 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 many overlapping um, kind of issues when you're talking about inequities and 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 health. Um, and you know, and, and then you gave many examples of, of displaced populations and kind of what their needs are. So, so how how do, how do you kind of lend to that in terms of how how can we kind of converge some of these um, these shared experiences of inequities to kind of really move the needle forward in terms of the ultimate goal of of of, of global health? Right. I mean, I think you know, I think intersectionality is the word of the day right now, and uh, particularly for all vulnerable populations, including um, asylum seekers. You know. Dr. Linton actually had um, asked a good question about how tomorrow is um, the last day to submit public comments for anybody who's able to, for um, the current administration right now is really um, creating the, the most far-reaching um, uh, policies right now to stop asylum seekers from entering the U.S. and tomorrow is the last day to submit your public comment. So I will be um, putting in the chat box about how you can submit public comment. But really, for anybody who um, is vulnerable in the world right now, it is really our duty as not just physicians, not just pediatricians, but humans to step up and speak out. So I think um, we can really connect with people. Um, on any level, and when we see some uh, health disparities or some inequities, then we can say, hey, you know, these people need food, they're hungry, or these people need care, let's, let's see where we can help. And I think that that really connects people on a human level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So here's here's a question um, about school reopenings. The, the the what's on a lot of people's mind right now. And I know we had a, a whole separate uh, the AP had a whole separate uh, webinar on on school openings. But I guess I'll I'll raise that question about uh, how do how does school reopenings look differently for children from minority populations? If they are disproportionately affected by COVID, how do we reopen schools safely, knowing that these youths um, really depend on 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 social services? I guess maybe Anissa, I don't know if you could comment on that. Like, you know, based on your population, you see at uh, at Harborview, 
um, is, 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 is your guidance as a primary care pediatrician, is that, is that different um, knowing um, you know, yeah. some of the challenges that are faced specific to that population? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that gives me um, honestly a lot of pause because I think about, um, yes, you know, as much as I do want schools to be open because children do benefit from schools and there is a significant digital divide, especially in the populations that I serve versus other um, populations who are well to do and don't have um, uh, don't have those barriers. Um, however, you know, what, what I think about is these are the same populations who are dying. These are the same populations who are um, who are not getting the well deserved um, care that they need. These are the populations that don't have access to care. Um, so I think it is a double edged sword in that um, these social services, I think, do need to be um, given to um, the children and they need to be supported in every way possible, regardless of whether they are physically sitting in those schools or not. And I think sometimes tying these um, services so intricately with schools actually makes this even more difficult. Um, that being said, I do want schools to actually have a good contingency plan for, you know, what happens if one person is positive? What happens to that community? What are the ramifications of coronavirus spreading in a tight-knit community such as a school? Um, and, you know, what happens in schools um, from these same populations that are often overcrowded, um, that often have, um, you know, teacher-student um, ratio that are not conducive to a learning environment, especially with, with COVID. So it is a much of a double-edged um, sword, and I do think that we really need to think about how do we get these social services to children, even if they're not physically sitting in a school. Um, and that is on us as a society that we've linked so many things, um, uh, such as, you know, um, key protections for, you know, key supports for families, things such as food, things such as a safe place to learn, uh, safe place to be during the day with schools so intricately in that our families just don't have anywhere to turn to when, when um, those programs are gone. So I won't pretend that I have a um, that I have a uh, great answer, but you know my own children attend the same schools with, with the, the same schools that my patients attend, and I do um, I do worry about them. They have so many barriers, and I sit in a place of relative uh, privilege. Um, so you know I, I won't pretend that I have the best answer, but those are the things that I think about a lot, and those are the kind of advice and um, guidance that I'm trying to give my patients. That's very helpful. I think you know, what frustrates me too is just like if if you know if the number of cases you know if if you had taken a, if you if you had done a good job of of reducing community transmission and being in a place like some of the other countries who have successfully reopened schools, mm -hmm. it's a completely different different story and and kind of the yeah. the blank the blanket statement that you know move forward and um it and 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 send kids to school and and just you know cross your fingers yeah. is, 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 is a one heart to follow. <laughs> yeah, I think that move forward mentality is what got us here. And we, we, we can't afford other lives while well, we can't. Yeah. And I would also say that, I mean, the solution doesn't necessarily need to come from the U.S., right? So we're now, you know, multiple countries facing different stages of similar problems. So there was one question in here that we won't be able to get to about radical innovation. And, um, this, like we can now have this global conversation about what could work, what, you know, now all ideas can be on the table and all sectors can come to the, the plate, right? And say, you know, it's not just the purview of physicians or educators, but really we can really think more innovatively about what to do and the solution may not be from here. Um, and so I think now's our chance to really talk globally about what to do locally and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I almost think it should not be from here, Dr. Khanna, right? Like, yeah, yeah. we haven't done this right. <laughs> we have yeah, not. They look so <laughs> we should look at other countries and see what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. Well, I think we are just at that, that time. So I really want to thank our uh, four panelists uh, for taking the time to be with us today. I know you guys are incredibly busy and, uh, and so appreciate that. And, and thanks to everyone for taking the time to join and, uh, and, and then thanks to the AP Global Health and Life Support, the section on global health, uh, the Council on Immigrant Child and Family Health and the Emory Global Health Institute for co-sponsoring this uh, session. It will be recorded, so we encourage you to tell your friends and your colleagues to, to go back and, and, and tune in. And, and then this is a, a save the date for the next in these uh, series on uh, Another important topic that started at the beginning of the, of the pandemic and has, has, has continued in terms of uh, personal protective equipment, what to wear and what to share 
um, time to order our face masks, I guess, or in our face shields, I guess. Um, so, so with that, uh, thank you and uh, have a good rest of your days. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you.